<clears throat> the class outline for this week, as I mentioned last week, I said that, well, we're going to actually get deeper into the nutrition recommendations. Since last week, we just cover mainly kidney function, chronic kidney disease stages, and complications of chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, we mentioned all the, um, you know, gout and anemia and edema and other complications and bone disease that can happen with CKD. But this week, we're going to focus on nutrition recommendations. And we're going to look at the benefits of nutrition at any stage, kind of like what dietary patterns will actually be healthy for your kidneys. Um, we have nutrition at different stages, and um, we can uh, mainly have nutrition considerations like protein, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, that would go into detail in terms of, um, you know, how much, when um, it's appropriate to restrict or not. So um, we're going to get started with um, just talking a little bit about what current research shows in terms of nutrition uh, benefit for um, slowing down the progression of CKD. So we know that nutrition, medical nutrition therapy for CKD improves biomarkers and slows time to dialysis. And this is from 2016, the Journal of Renal Nutrition. And those results sh shows that basically when patients receive MNT, the me medical nutrition therapy, they're less likely to start um, dialysis and they had improved nutritional biomarkers than, uh, than the participants that did not receive this nutrition therapy. Um, nutrition interventions have demonstrated improvements in glucose and blood pressure control, which remember we said diabetes and high blood pressure are the main actually causes of CKD. Um, and those improvements slow the CKD progression and again, delaying the need for dialysis. Um, in general, I think the best approach is an individualized approach and recommendations should be based on each person's age and other health conditions. Remember some, some people have diabetes, some do not. Um, some people, um, you know, they have, um, um, we mentioned gout can, can cause CKD and CKD can, patients with CKD are at a higher risk of gout. And, and uh, you know, some have gout, some don't, some have high blood pressure, some don't. So it's really important to, to kind of individualize this nutrition um, advice. And, um, you know, sometimes um, people ask, like, what would be healthy foods for CKD? And it really, it's not a simple answer because it really depends on what other conditions you have underlying. Again, do you need to lose weight? Are you overweight or not? Um, so, but keep in mind, if you have diabetes or prediabetes or you have high blood pressure, controlling blood pressure and blood sugars, it's a very important um, um, way to actually slow down the progression of CKD. In terms of dietary patterns that are healthy for CKD patients, um, we have this, um, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, when people were asking what would be a CKD friendly diet, nobody thought that much that, you know, it's high in fruits and vegetables. And uh, that's, we used to think of kidney diet being a little bit less healthy and more boring and, and more restricted, uh, restrictive. But um, nowadays with more evidence, uh, it's been shown that a plant-based diet like a Mediterranean diet pattern actually can be beneficial and it improves um, lipid profiles. It improves actually weight, diabetes management, um, it's heart healthy. And those, all those things are correlated with, with CKD and kidney health too. So um, unless, um, as I said, in, in adults with stages, stages one to four, even uh, one to five, not on dialysis, um, increased fruits and vegetables intake may decrease actually all those markers that can contribute to CKD. And also can decrease this net acid production, um, which um, it's been shown to be beneficial to the kidneys. Um, I like to use with my patients the my plate model of eating, and um, especially if someone that has the classic picture, maybe diabetes, overweight, um, they have um, heart disease or they're at risk of heart disease, and they might have CKD stage three, for example. Um, I think this uh, my plate model of eating. Uh, 
will actually help with all those um, medical conditions that they have. So half of the plate, um, I ask people to have, make half of their plate most of the time, 80, 90% of their meals to be um, non-starchy vegetables. And um, in a week, ideally it would be to use uh, the color of rainbow and have a variety of colors within your fresh produce. Uh, vegetables and fruits. So, um, you know, make sure when you shop to buy something yellow, orange, red, purple, green, um, and not necessarily with each meal to have the color of the rainbow. But again, in a week would be good to have this um, um, color of rainbow because each antioxidant, antioxidants are usually pig pigments in fruits and vegetables. So you kind of um, get a, a good uh, good variety and good range of antioxidants when you uh, eat by color. So half a plate, colorful, non-starchy vegetables, and the other half of the plate would be split in between, you know, the starch, ideally a healthy starch, high in fiber, like whole grains and legumes and starchy vegetables, like, um, you know, potatoes, sweet potatoes, winter squashes, corn and peas. And then the other half of the plate would be the protein, the other quarter of a plate, um, I meant, sorry, uh, to be the protein. And ideally, most of the time, that should be lean protein that's less in saturated fat. Things like chicken, turkey with no skin, and um, eggs, and fish, and shellfish, um, low fat, non fat um, dairy products. Um, you know, lean red meats, um, I would still limit the consumption of those to, um, you know, a couple of times a week, or we say in general, try to limit red, red meat consumption to no more than 12 ounces in a week. So but when you look at the animal protein on this plate, uh, this piece of chicken here, it's the size and the thickness of maybe a deck of, so that's about three ounces. And again, when you look at the whole plate, about three quarters of the plate in between your vegetables and your starch is plant-based. And this is kind of a, a definition of the, this bigger term of plant-based, you know, plant-based includes also veganism and vegetarianism and somebody is pescatarian, but, um, but also you could consume um, meat and, and chicken, but it's, it's just the, the ratio on the plate, you know, when when the majority of the foods on a regular basis are coming from plants, um, you kind of eat on a plant based um, diet pattern. So this would be ideal, as I said, for CKD patients. And when you look at that, and uh, remember last time we talked about protein being something that um, CKD patients need to limit. Um, the, the size and the portion of protein is not that big on a plant-based diet. Revisiting nutrients of concern, again, protein, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. We're gonna talk in more detail today about those. And then I'm gonna have a slide at the end to mention others. But we're gonna start with protein. How much protein should I eat? And uh, it's been kind of a little bit back and forth for the past at least 10 years. The recommendations changed a few times. Um, but um, we all know that excess, excessive protein intake increases this waste in the blood, um, so more nitrogen um, um, waste material from, from the protein metabolism and the kidneys are, are kind of work harder, working harder to remove it. So um, it's important to what we like to say, not put as much strain on your kidneys that are not functioning as properly. Many studies suggest that limiting uh, protein intake and following a plant-based diet pattern may slow the loss of kidney function. So it can be beneficial to, again, limit the protein as you follow this uh, plant-based diet. Low protein for CKD, as I said, has been controversial. And then there were questionable, benef questionable benefits. There was the risk of malnutrition, people not, um, you know, losing more muscle mass. It was hard. It's, it's hard in general to follow a low protein diet just because our classical, um, classical American diet, it's high in protein. But overall, the newest recommendations since um, from 2020 from National Kidney Foundation, American um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, we basically the recommendations as in CKD patients stages three and five who are metabolically stable, a low protein diet is recommended 
And that would be, um, in terms of the specific recommendation, it's 0 0.55 to 0 0.60 grams of dietary protein per kilogram per day. And I will have a slide in a way to show you how we kind of those very specific recommendations with grams and kilograms that people are not actually familiar with, uh, how they translate into a day of eating. Um, but for now, we'll keep this 0 0.55 to 0 0.6 grams of dietary protein per kilogram per day. I wanted to say a normal uh, dietary recommendation for protein is actually 0 0.8 grams of dietary protein per kilogram per day. So I wanted to show you that this um, lower protein is not way um, lower than what we would recommend for a, um, let's say a healthy individual with no CKD. However, we all know that um, again, in our, um, in our uh, today, day by day life, people eat just um, much more protein than what's recommended for a healthy adult. Um, also, the recommendations are for a very low protein diet, the VLPD um, of 0 0.28 to 0 0.43 grams dietary protein per kilogram per day with additional keto acids, um, which are some amino acids analogs uh, to meet the protein requirements of the 0 0.55, 0 0.6. So those... Um, um, keto acid, um, keto acids are basically some, um, actually I, I have here a slide with there's keto analogs that are some supplements. This is a medical food that basically contains a nitrogen free type of amino acids. So they do not, when they're metabolized and digested and uh, metabolized, they're not actually adding more nitrogen to the kidney um, to kind of filter and and um, and process. So they're what we say they don't put as much strain on the kidneys, don't put extra strain on the kidneys. So for a very low protein diet um, of that 0 0.28 to 0 0.43 grams per kilogram. Um, you could get that from regular foods, right? Those protein sources. And then for the rest of the protein recommendation, you supplement with those keto, keto analogs. And then the dose recommended, I have it here at the bottom of the slide is 0 0.1 grams per kilogram per day. So just to give you an example for someone that's maybe 132 pounds, like 60 kilos, that will translate in about six grams of those keto analogs a day. And there are a few products available, um, not that many. It's a medical food again. Um, so it's not a nutrition supplement, it's not a food, it's not a medication. It's within this category of a medical food, but there are, as I said, few brands and um, they come in forms of a powder drink that you kind of mix a vanilla flavor, or you could take some capsules by mouth. And then again, they you will supplement and will give you additional protein so you're not um, um, experience any muscle wasting. Um, you kind of your body gets more protein, but without putting that extra strain on your kidneys. And um, so there are again studies that show that those keto acid analog has been shown to reduce CKD progression, slow the onset of uremic symptoms and improve the nutritional marker. So can be um, based on research, um, can be used successfully. Um, and uh, I wanted to say that because people get confused just because of the name of, of those, uh, those keto analogs do not, they're not related with ketogenic diet by any means. They're, it's the high fat, low carbohydrate type of diet that people read about or um, follow for certain, um, for certain reasons. But these keto analogs, as I said, they're keto amino acids. Um, and it's basically there are some nitrogen free amino acids in a, in a supplemental form. Going back to the protein recommendations. Um, so we have, um, remember I said on a low protein diet, 0 0.55 to 0 0.6 grams of, of protein per kilogram per day. And then for people with diabetes stages uh, three and five, it is reasonable to recommend 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. Remember that 0 0.8, it's also the normal uh, recommendation for healthy adults. 
to maintain a stable nutritional status and optimize glycemic control. And the reason is also somebody with diabetes need to restrict the carbs and uh, would be hard to on a you know restricted protein, restricted carb diet to kind of like figure out what to eat. But overall, um, uh, this would be the recommendation if you have diabetes. In adults with CKD stage five on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis who are metabolically stable, the amount of protein is higher and it uh, usually ranges between one to 1.2 grams protein per kilogram per day to maintain a stable nutritional status. There are losses that happen, um, protein losses that happen with the hemodialysis um, now the protein type, people ask like which, how much uh, animal versus plant to eat. Um, and then again, we don't have a good evidence at this point in adults with CKD stages one to five, it's unclear what time would, of protein would be more beneficial. Um, and just in terms of blood lipids, calcium, phosphor levels, all those things. But overall, I think, um, you know, 50 to 50 ratio seem to be a good um, a good uh, one to go by animal, 50% animal versus 50% plant. I wanted to mention some evidence uh, from a review study from 2017 that more plant-based foods actually, it, they're more valuable um, um, in the sense that basically people that were eating in that review um, people that were eating more plant-based foods, they actually end up eating less processed foods and they lessen the production of ages, which is advanced glycation and products. And then it looks like with um, people have more of those um, ages accumulating in their, in their body as CKD progresses. Um, those are compounds that are... Um, kind of um, are seen in, in people, their compounds they increase inflammation and they're seen uh, in, in patients that will have diabetes, they will have those chronic diseases, um, um, like heart disease and, and where the inflammation, it's kind of at the root of all those uh, chronic diseases in our society. Ways to limit the production of those um, advanced glycation um, end products, um, so definitely those seem to be more prevalent in animal products that are high fat, high protein. Um, also processed foods and high sugary foods seem to have a lot of those um, ages. That's how I'm gonna call them, ages. Um, so definitely reducing those in your diet and when you're eating based on what I just described, a plant-based uh, diet with more whole foods, more plant-based foods, you're actually not getting a lot of those foods that are um, having the potential uh, to increase ages. Limit cooking with dry heat and high temperatures. So it looks like cooking method really increases the production of those uh, glycation products and uh, limiting the dry heat, high temperature cooking and cooking more with moist heat, lower temperature, shorter time of cooking. So for example, instead of grilling and broiling and, and baking and roasting, uh, could do more poaching and steaming and boiling and um, like, um, for example, a grilled meat versus a stew, you know, that's a difference of dry heat and high heat temperature versus moist heat and lower temperature. Think about cooking in a slow cooker would be also uh, better. And it looks like also cooking over ceramic surfaces, kind of like the slow cooker would be um, more beneficial to not create a lot of those um, ages. Cooking meats with acidic um, ingredients like vinegar, lemon juice, and tomato juice can be helpful to actually decrease the production of those. And um, Again, as I said, eating more whole foods, plant-based foods, high in antioxidants, um, foods high in antioxidants, that, that would be kind of a way to decrease um, the accumulation of ages in your body and regular exercise does that too, as well. Moving forward, I wanted to kind of show you steps to, uh, to calculate the daily protein using this recommendation that let's say you don't have diabetes, you have CKD stages three to five. 
um, you want to divide your weight in pounds to 2.2 to find your weight in kilograms. Then you multiply that weight in kilograms um, by 0 0.55 and then by 0 0.6. So then you get a range. And I have an example here, um, you know, 30, 136 pound woman, um, she's 61.8 kilograms. And then basically if we multiply that 68. Eight uh, by 0 0.55, we get this 33.99, which we round up to 34 grams of protein per day. And then we do the same with the 0 0.6. So we get the upper range of the recommendation and we round up to 37 grams of protein per day. So the daily protein intake should range in between 34 to 37 on this low protein diet. And now I want to show you a few examples of how much protein in different uh, food groups? Like, of course, poultry, fish, meats in an ounce, you have about seven grams. Daily products in a cup, you have about seven to eight or an ounce of cheese. So those are considered uh, good protein sources because they give you a lot of protein in one serving. Starches usually in a serving, either if it's a slice of bread or a third cup of cooked grain, um, would be about two grams and vegetables half a cup, barely a gram, um, some more, some less. I usually don't count as much the protein from vegetables. I use mainly the, the, the starches and the, you know, the good sources of protein and then no protein for fruits and fats. So I have here a table that shows you how much in uh, protein, grams of protein in different servings of different protein foods. And the deck of cards that I was mentioning earlier on that my plate model of eating um, has about three ounces and that has about 21 grams of protein. And then for each ounce of belly meat, you have seven grams, a cup of milk would be eight. I want to point out, because you're going to have this table um, available with the slides, but I want to point from um, the dairy products, um, you know, Greek yogurt and cottage cheese, they're here. So about three ounces of yogurt, when you compare regular yogurt, six ounces, about eight grams. In Greek yogurt, three ounces, so half of that amount has about the same amount of protein. So process of making pro, um, Greek yogurt and cottage cheese just concentrates more the protein. So those particular uh, dairy products um, are more concentrated in protein. So I wanted to point out because we talk yogurt, but there's a difference between regular yogurt and Greek yogurt. Um, and then again, we have, um, for example, soy milk has also in a cup five, six grams. This is more like a plant-based food. And then almond milk, eight ounces, it has just two. Some are having just one, so not a good source of protein. Um, eggs, one egg or egg whites, um, those are about seven. The same with a quarter of a cup of nuts or two tablespoons of nut butter. You know, it's five to seven, depending on the kind. Um, again, more plant-based proteins on this page. You see beans and lentils, so legumes, half a cup, about seven grams. Um, and then um, tempeh and tofu in half a cup, you get 10 grams or seven grams in a quarter of a cup of tempeh. Also, we have at the end uh, two types of grains, quinoa that we know it's more concentrating protein. It's actually a seed, um, but uh, we look at it as a grain. But quinoa in a cup, you get nine grams of protein compared with brown rice or even white rice in a cup, it's about five. Um, so a sample for that 36 grams of protein, so that would be in that range we calculated for that particular woman, 34 to 37, so we chose 36, and how does it look like in a, in a day of eating? So breakfast, we have this three-quarter cup of oatmeal with honey, and then one hard-boiled egg and a cup of strawberries. Lunch sandwich with two slices of bread two ounces of tuna salad, lettuce, tomato, and mustard, and a mixed green salad with an apple. And dinner, a quinoa bowl with half a cup of cooked quinoa, a quarter cup of cooked black beans, um, chopped cucumber, tomatoes, avocado, and a cup of raspberries with cold whip. So this is an example of how a day of 36 grams of protein would look like. And of course, you could kind of mix and match and do your own variation based on the table 
of uh, foods that are, um, you know, grams of protein for different foods in different servings. And the, I, I mean, likely because again, somebody that weighs a little bit more than this particular woman will have a little bit more um, uh, of a protein budget. Remember this recommendation is per kilogram body weight. So um, if you are a little bit um, kind of like smaller frame and your protein recommendation is it's, um, lower, I would say likely one of the meals um, in a day um, should probably be, be vegan or very plant-based, you know, uh, with very minimal animal product in order to stay within the, this recommendation. In this case, dinner was basically a, a vegan meal and then lunch had a little bit of two nine breakfast, breakfast had a hard boiled egg. Um, so moving forward, um, um, I wanna talk a little bit about sodium. Um, so sodium, it's naturally present in many foods. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of point out that 75% of the sodium in our diet does not come from naturally occurring sodium in foods or from the salt shaker that you might use. It's mainly from processed foods, restaurant eating. Um, so that's the bulk of our sodium intake. That's about 75% of, of the sodium consumed comes from those sources. And um, I want to point out the difference between salt and sodium because table salt is not 100% sodium. It's actually 40% sodium and 60% chloride. It's sodium chloride. And basically, uh, I put here some salt sodium conversions for you to be helpful because we're going to talk about recommendations of sodium, not salt. So basically, at the end, you'll see here one teaspoon of salt equals about 2,000 milligrams of sodium. And this actually, it's a good number for someone that has CKD and has high blood pressure. Um, so a teaspoon of salt would be 2000 milligrams of sodium. Sodium, we all know that can actually um, increase high, uh, blood pressure. So we have this high blood pressure that can damage kidney in these blood vessels. Um, the kidneys cannot remove waste and extra fluids and you have fluid buildup um, and in blood vessels and then decrease even more. The high blood pressures, it's a vicious cycle and then definitely high sodium uh, will actually fuel the cycle if you, if I can say that. So um, sodium restriction, it can help with protecting kidneys and, and managing better blood pressure. In terms of recommendations, I have here limit to 2000 or lower, I have 1500 to 2300. So the whole idea is that if you have CKD, but you don't have high blood pressure, you're not taking any medication for blood pressure and you're not having blood pre high blood pressure, you could um, use the recommendation of 2300 milligrams a day. Um, but if you have blood pressure, um, definitely high blood pressure, I would say 15 to 2, 1500 to 2000 milligrams of sodium a day would be a better, a better recommendation. So I wanted to point out that um, in general, I mean, um, the average um, in, a, in the average American diet, the sodium daily sodium intake, it's over 3,500, some, some studies show 4,000 milligrams or more. So even this 2,300 milligrams, it's pretty in a way um, uh, restrictive or harder to, to stick with, especially if, um, if the diet contains a lot of eating out or a lot of packaged um, foods, uh, processed foods, as opposed to more cooking from scratch, whole foods, eating. Um, I wanted to point out that the regular table salt, the sea salt, kosher uh, salt, or even Himalayan salt, you know, there's so many kinds of salt now available on the market, but they're all kind of equal when it comes to sodium content. So there's no big variation between how much sodium those actually contain. So they're about the same. However, I had patients mentioning to me say, well, I like to use sea salt because I feel like it salts better or enhances the flavor to the point that I'm using less. And in this particular case, I would say then if you have a preference and if you feel that 
you're using actually less salt because a salt is better or salts better your food, then I would definitely uh, use that because it will help you actually use less. Uh, for CKD patients, definitely it's not recommended to use the salt substitutes like light salt, no salt. Those products actually, they're labeled as lower salt, but instead of sodium chloride, that salt is potassium chloride. So that means it will add to your um, potassium um, intake. And um, again, as we talked last week, um, with the kidney function decreasing, um, your body ability to um, you know, to get rid of potassium and um, would, would, um, would decrease. And then that can allow potassium to accumulate in your blood. It's not good. So definitely I would not use those salt substitutes. Um, I want to have a list here and go over with um, about high sodium foods, which ones are those ones. So at the top, as I mentioned, processed foods, fast food and restaurant food. Um, those are kind of your main sources of sodium. Most frozen and canned foods are actually pretty high in sodium. However, with canned foods, I want to say that nowadays um, they're more and more available, those not just reduced sodium options, but low sodium or even no salt added options. And you could find those with canned beans or even tomato sauces. Um, even there are a few brands that uh, pasta sauce, uh, that's kind of marinara pasta sauce, for example, uh, that are very low sodium. So with canned foods, I think, um, depending reading labels and depending what, um, um, what brands you're purchasing, you can have low sodium options. Frozen foods, the prepared frozen dinners, uh, it's a little bit difficult. You might have some with less, but they're still going to be quite high overall. Smoked and cured meats are another category. And um, this is something that will include anything from deli meats um, to sausages and bacon and hams and like even smoked salmon. And it's a good example because I had a patient that um, she... Uh, last week she had edema um, and she noticed that in her extremities and she was wondering why is this happening but uh, talking to her um, I realized she was having smoked salmon sandwiches for the whole week she, she, she likes so smoked salmon and thought that salmon it's a healthy food um, and it's just did not realize how much sodium is in um, in the smoked salmon again most cheeses also will be high in sodium um, pickles, sauerkraut, olives, most soups and salad dressings. Um, again, something that you purchase that are commercially um, um, made. Um, again, most commercially prepared sauces, condiments and seasonings will have also high sodium and many breakfast cereals and breads. Unfortunately, there are breads that per slice will have up to 300 milligrams of sodium. So imagine you have a sandwich and that's 600 milligrams of sodium just in the bread, not putting, not adding maybe the cheese or the deli meat or whatever has that, uh, that uh, sandwich in. So definitely always read nutrition labels and ingredient lists. And uh, this is very important. And I wanted to show you here how to look for, um, so sodium is listed down here under cholesterol and usually will come, uh, it will show as milligrams, this particular one per serving, which would be six crackers. It has about 180 milligrams. And then it gives you a percentage, 8%. I like to use the percentage, the rule of thumb, whatever it's five or under is low in that nutrient, whatever it's 20 or more, it's high in that nutrient. So by this definition, you know, um, this is not necessarily the lowest, but 8% is pretty close to 5%. So I would say definitely it's those six crackers are considered low sodium and can be a good option. Um, um, they say here at the bottom, not a good choice. If it's greater than 8% uh, per serving, salt is listed in the first five ingredients. Usually the ingredient list will contain um, will list the ingredients from the most abundant to the least abundant. So it's in the first five, you know, that's going to be quite a bit of salt, right? Um, overall, 
we want uh, per serving sodium to be under 200 milligrams. And this particular one kind of fits that definition, 180 per six crackers. Can you find better than that within crackers and brands? Probably, yes. And I think it's just a matter of like trying different products and see, nutritionally speaking, what makes sense and also taste-wise, what would be your preference. But overall, this would be an example of a good um, product. And then I have here some salt and salt seasoning, kind of like equivalents. Um, instead of this, do this. So in term, instead of all those table salt, seasoning salt, garlic salt, onion salt, I won't buy those products because you know they'll have quite a bit of salt in them. But I would buy fresh garlic and fresh onion and garlic powder, onion powder. Um, again, bouillon cubes are high in sodium, flavor enhancers are high in sodium, meat tenderizers, and um, you could make your own, uh, I always say those um, um, marinades also, I, I always tell my patient to make their own marinade, and for a marinade, you just need to use some fat, olive oil, some, some acid, you know, either vinegar or lemon juice, and then you could use your seasoning, you know, any herbs and spices, garlic, whatever you like, you could add a little bit of salt, but you're gonna, you, that meat will have way less sodium than what's already bought marinated um, um, from a store, so making your own will save a lot of sodium. Uh, a lot of sauces, um, you know, and it uh, will have uh, high sodium. Soy sauce, we know, but also oyster sauce and steak sauce, barbecue sauce. Um, making your own, again, in this case, um, will help and will save quite a bit of sodium. Then we have cured meats versus, you know, trying to cook more with fresh meats and not uh, with uh, cured or processed meats. And then canned foods, um, with those, as I said, looking at the nutrition label and finding those products that will have either reduced low or no added salt um, labels, that would be very helpful. Um, ways to reduce sodium, you avoid processed foods, um, limit eating out, cook more often at home, maybe limit eating out once or twice a week, um, use more herbs and spices uh, when you cook, and you have some examples here. Um, so it's a good point for people that are more into cooking and more uh, foodies. Uh, you want that acid finish with salt a lot of times, but you can get that from vinegars or lemon juice, kind of squeezing some lemon juice at the end. Um, making your own condiments the way we I mentioned already. And then again, buy reduce low or no salt added canned foods. With potassium, um, so we move into the next um, nutrient of concern, potassium. The role is to keep a normal water balance. And, and as I mentioned last, the, um, last week, um, potassium is involved in muscle contraction. And as we know, our main muscle here that contracts on a regular basis is the heart. So um, too low or too high potassium levels can actually create arrhythmia and um, irregular heartbeats. So Kidneys, they remove that excess of potassium on a no healthy kind of individual with not, no CKD. You eat more potassium, your kidneys will eliminate that. But in CKD, potassium can, can accumulate and again, can be very, very dangerous for your heart. And, um, you know, it's always good to check potassium levels uh, if you have CKD and you have here some ranges. Um, definitely more than 5.5 is, um, is not good. So when potassium is high, when we have this hyperkalemia that we talked about last week, um, dietary restriction for potassium um, seemed to be, um, you know, something that uh, sounds like a good idea and usually should be less than 2.4 grams a day, or we would say less than 2,400 milligrams a day, which is the same thing. Um, it's good to kind of be aware that other things can increase your potassium in your, in your blood, not just the diet. So 
you know, blood pressure medication, for example, um, like lisinopril, those ACE uh, inhibitors, uncontrolled diabetes, acidosis, chronic constipation. So always check with your doctor, you know, if you have, uh, if you're told that your labs are higher than normal, kind of um, make sure that you're not on uh, having any of those that can actually impact that, that uh, high um, um impact your potassium level in your blood. Some diuretics can decrease potassium, what we call potassium depleting. They're diuretics that are potassium sparing, that they kind of help maintaining the potassium in your blood. So if you are on the diuretics, again, check with your doctor, make sure you're on the right one. And if having high potassium, um, as I said, uh, yeah, check with your doctor to just make sure before you restrict your diet, um, that there are no other causes that, um, that lead to this hyperkalemia. And again, if you need to restrict diet, because uh, sometimes that's the, that's the case, um, I wanted for you to be familiar with high uh, sources of potassium. And those usually are 200 milligrams of potassium per serving or more. So that's the definition of a high potassium food. And you can definitely enjoy smaller amounts of those following foods. So it doesn't have to be a complete restriction. Remember you have a budget of 2,400 milligrams. So it's a, just a matter of like how much you're eating of those foods, how many in a day um, that would not allow you to go over that budget. So um, just to be aware which foods, I think it's very helpful to be aware what foods uh, are actually high in potassium. And you have a list here, you know, fruits, the avocado, banana, cantaloupe, uh, kiwi, honeydew melon, orange, mango, nectarine, papaya. And there are some more extensive actually lists that exist and um, um, you can actually access to be aware if you really need to um, limit potassium to be aware what are those some of those high sources. And even with those, I mean, I have a, a, a table that I love, but uh, within that, it shows you exactly what food, what portion and how many milligrams. And it's a lot of variation because those high potassium food, as I said, it starts from 200 milligrams per serving to more. And then there's a big difference between, let's say, um, I don't know, maybe, um, um, maybe, apricots that are more in the 200 to 20 milligrams per serving to a baked potato that's about 900 milligrams. Um, so definitely even within that high potassium uh, food list, there can be a lot of variations how much potassium each individual fruit uh, or food will have. Uh, within vegetables, some of them, again, potatoes are some of the highest, uh, sweet potato, tomato products, um, winter squash, spinach, other greens, asparagus, artichoke. Other foods would include protein foods like meats and fish and milk and yogurt, beans, some nuts. And um, again, um, those are some of the highest in potassium, almonds, pistachio, and hazelnuts, those in particular. So it's even more important to stick with the serving if you like to eat those. And dry fruits also like apricots, dates, figs, prunes, raisins are high. Um, portion control is important. And also be careful if you have also diabetes because those are high in sugar. Uh, lower potassium alternatives that you could eat more liberally, they're less than 200 milligrams per serving. And then you have within fruits, we have apples and berries and peaches, pineapple, cherries, pears, plums, grapes, watermelon, limit to a cup. And then with vegetables, we have um, raw broccoli and raw spinach. The one with higher, actually, the spinach was cooked. And I forgot to mention, because usually spinach it shrinks a lot. You start with a bag, you cook it, you get like a cup. But that concentrates um, a lot of the potassium, right? Because you start with such a larger portion. Um, and then it goes on with green beans and corn and carrots. Again, you'll have those foods with your slides. And then um, others would be the nuts uh, that basically um, walnuts, macadamia nuts, cashews, pecans, and peanuts are actually lower um, uh, potassium type of nuts. Remember that even 
a lower potassium, if you eat a lot of that um, in a day, that can actually become a high potassium type of food and can still, um, so portion control and moderation, it's something to keep in my mind in with every, any kind of food. Um, there's also a way to leach potassium from vegetables and that will remove some of the potassium, especially from root vegetables like potatoes. As I said, they're high. Um, it's not clear how much you, but you know, it can help if you're on a budget. Um, you're supposed to wash and peel and slice the vegetable into an eighth of an inch slice. And then you add two times the amount of water to the amount of vegetables. And then you bring that to a boil. you change the water and you cook until soft and tender. And that, that kind of, um, this method can help you leach some of potassium, but I can tell you how much overall it's not consistent. Um, I don't know um, if we know for sure, but we'll remove some of the potassium. Then phosphorus, we know, we talked about it last week. It's uh, important to keep your bones strong. Um, again, the kidneys, when they, they're not functioning as well, they have a, a problem with, with removing excess phosphorus and uh, high phosphorus into low calcium in the blood. And then that will trigger that um, increase in parathyroid hormone production and that can pull calcium out of your bones and include um, can weaken your bone and can increase calcium in your blood. So kind of um, basically um, ruins a little bit the balance that we have with calcium, phosphorus and the parathyroid hormone to keep our bones health and keep those uh, electrolytes normal in, in the blood. So um, it's important to not um, have high phosphorus, especially to protect your bones. Um, in terms of recommendations, lately it's been shown to be more an individualized approach. We had this 800 to 1,000 milligrams a day of, of phosphorus. Um, however, I I want I don't want to emphasize it as much because I feel like when people follow a lower protein diet, the way we describe in the first, uh, I described in the first slides, you know, you'll notice that um, uh, high phosphorus foods are actually the protein. So by lowering your protein, you're going to lower your phosphorus too. In early stages, I like to recommend for my patients to avoid um, phosphate additives. So more avoid processed food, avoid drinking dark colas like Coke and Pepsi, those have uh, phosphates in them. And then again, a lot of those processed foods, when you look at the ingredient list, um, there are lots of fast words, right? It might be sodium phosphate or um, calcium phosphate, all kinds of phosphate uh, additives that will, they are used as stabilizer preservatives or color enhancers in our food uh, environment. So I ask people not to necessarily reduce their, the natural occurring phosphorus um, in foods, just those um, processed foods. And then as your kidney function decreases and kind of um, reaches the stage five with a GFR of 15, uh, phosphorus binders may be necessary. Um, so people would take those with food and then uh, the phosphorus will bind with those binders and then basically in the GI tract and then they're not, uh, the phosphorus doesn't get absorbed, gets eliminated. Um, Again, with the sources of phosphorus, I wanted to mention that those are usually your protein foods like meats and dairy products and beans and peas and um, whole grains too, in this case, nuts, but also we have beer, chocolate and colas that um, those are all more the organic. Um, I mean, with the exception actually of cola because that's an additive, um, it's not naturally like, but in the other foods, this is naturally occurring phosphorus and usually only about 40 to 60% of it is absorbed in your body, but the phosphorus containing additives um, are better absorbed and the absorption is estimated around 90%. So um, that's another good reason to actually start by cutting the phosphate additives in your diet when you need to lower uh, phosphorus. That's the kind of inorganic phosphorus that's, uh, that's in those um, and other nutri nutrition considerations, I mentioned that I'm gonna talk a little bit about calcium, vitamin D, and anemia. Last week, um, we talked about uh, complications of CKD and we touched upon those, but definitely 
uh, for calcium, it's good to have adequate calcium. With CKD, we want to make sure there's not too low or too high calcium in your blood. Um, it's not recommended to exceed 2,000 milligrams of calcium by any means. And some studies actually show that 800 to 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day, which is a little bit under the RDA for calcium, the regular recommendation, it might be a good goal for people with CKD stages three, four, who are not taking active vitamin D. Um, so um, this is, you know, this is something to just consider. Vitamin D, we know, and we mentioned that um, kidneys activate vitamin D and basically patients with CKD that are higher risk of vitamin D deficiency. Um, so vitamin D needs to be monitored. And um, again, um, you need to supplement accordingly. A lot of times um, um, this um, uh, activated kind of vitamin D works better because again, um, your kidneys would not have to activate it, which they can't do that anymore. If the calcium gets too high, you have to stop the vitamin D supplementation. So definitely the labs need to mo be monitored and, um, and changes need to happen according to your um, lab values. And with anemia, um, I mentioned last week that that's kind of common with CKD, especially later stages, um, because the kidneys are not producing anymore that much of the um, eripro, um, eripopoietin hormone, and um, that stimulates the red blood cell production. So again, it needs to be tested. Patients need to be tested for anemia and um, treat accordingly, which we talked this um, um, that they might need to take this uh, EPO um, hormone by mouth. Um, so there's no diet that's right for everyone. Uh, as I mentioned, and ideally would be for somebody with CKD, depending on also what other health conditions they have, um, it's important to talk with their doctor to maybe see a dietitian one on one. Um, also, what you can or cannot eat can change in time based on your progression. Um, I kind of um, wanted to give you an example and overview of recommendations at different stages, and also kind of make you understand that um, those recommendations can, can be a little bit different depending on what stage you're in and also what other um, medical background you have. I have here some references. 